On the windy morning of September 10, 1967, Harry King set out from his ranch house in the San Luis Valley to look for his sister's missing horse. She hadn't shown up for food and water in days, a strange occurrence that clearly worried him enough to mount a one-person search party. What he found an hour after scouring the property made headlines the world over and single-handedly catapulted the concept of cattle mutilations into the public consciousness, forever linking them with sci-fi flavoured tales of UFOs. This is the story of an Appaloosa named Lady who became forever known as Snippy the Horse. This series is brought to you by viewer support on Patreon. You can sign up for as little as £1 a month which gives you early access to videos and helps to fund the research and creation of these documentaries. Go to the link in the description or the pinned comment and sign up today. Stretching between Colorado and New Mexico, the San Luis Valley is the largest high altitude desert in North America, home to the UFO watchtower and somewhat of a mecca for new age religious groups, including the infamous Love Has One cult. It's an area that's become synonymous with high strangeness. Over the decades, the valley has seen everything from Bigfoot and occult activity to portal openings and encounters with flying humanoids. There's a lot of things about that area that I I find are very intriguing. Some some of the oldest known traces of humans in North America are found right there. So I think the area itself uh, deserves a mention because it was the location for this particular case. In 1967, the San Luis Valley was home to the King Cattle Ranch, 2,000 acres of land that belonged to Harry King and his family. He lived there with his elderly mother Agnes, along with his sister Nellie and her husband, Burl Lewis. They owned three horses, including a three-year-old female Appaloosa named Lady and another named Snippy. Like clockwork, the three horses would make their way to the ranch house for food and water in the mornings and evenings. It was a dependable routine, but little did Harry King know that the evening of September 7th would be the last time he'd see Lady alive. When she didn't show up the next evening, Harry began to worry, and on September 9th, he set out to look for her. What he found made headlines the world over and single-handedly catapulted the concept of cattle mutilations into the public consciousness. And I'm, I'm assuming that everyone in your audience knows what a cattle mutilation is or a live unexplained livestock death as i prefer to refer to them as this is christopher o'brien and in 2014 he released his book stalking the herd an in-depth investigation into the cattle mutilation mystery it's an animal that's found missing soft tissue organs like the reproductive organs in the rear end of a female animal uh, the genitalia uh, the mammary glands an eye possibly an ear um, oftentimes the mandible flesh is cut and reveal a, reveals a jawbone uh, with no bleeding. And the jawbone is oftentimes des described as being a, an unnatural white color. In order to get that effect, you'd have to boil the jawbone in a lye solution for many hours, and it would still not give you that polished ghostly white color that we often associate with a classic mutilation. A longtime resident of the San Luis Valley, He's been investigating the strange occurrences there since the early 90s, publishing a series of books on the mysterious goings on. Innocently enough, uh, it started at a, a New Year's Eve party that I had on New Year's Eve 92. I lived in a little mountain town of about 250 people in one of the more remote areas of North America. I had heard about strange things going on in the area. You know, the snippy case I had known about since I was actually a little kid. I figured all that stuff was ancient history. I, I didn't really pay much attention uh, to it. And uh, come December 31st, 92, when I had this party, uh, everywhere I went in the party, little groups of people were talking about a very impressive uh, UFO sighting that uh, featured 200 foot ovals that came down, swooped down out of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, this huge wall of mountains that was right behind the town where I lived. And, uh, and they came out down and flew over the town. About 18, 20 people saw them. 
I kind of interviewed everybody separately and, and started taking notes and then brought everybody together towards the end of the party and said, do you, do you all realize that you all shared a sighting experience? Sightings in the valley weren't exactly unheard of. Back in the summer of 1967, there had been all manner of reports of strange objects in the skies. Paul Nicholas of the Alamosa Valley Courier had begun tabulating the reports by May. And there were tons of them. Stories of pulsating red and green lights, rumours of a UFO exploding in the air, and bizarre cigar-shaped clouds that may not have been clouds at all. I mean, cars literally were lining the roads waiting for UFOs to show up, and um, small UFOs were actually dive-bombing cars along the road that goes right out front a quarter mile away from where the snippy side is. These little, uh, they were like 12 to 15 foot scout ships with dive bomb cars there. These sightings in Colorado in 1967 certainly weren't the first. By the 1960s, most people were familiar with the modern concept of UFOs. Kenneth Arnold's sighting in the Mount Rainier area of Washington in 1947 kickstarted the flying disc craze. I looked way off here to the north, and that's what I saw where the flash came from. It was a, an echelon formation of a very peculiar looking aircraft. And the public appetite for wild UFO stories continued throughout the decades, thanks to a mix of tabloid saucer stories and the growing popularity of science fiction. While some put the sightings down to simple anomalies in the sky, mass hysteria or hoaxes, others pointed their fingers towards military and intelligence services that stoked UFO hysteria to suit their own agendas. As Mark Pilkinson writes in Mirage Men, Looking back at the UFO's first decade, it's clear to see that the military and civilian intelligence agencies acted as midwives in the birthing of the UFO myth. Now the day before Snippy, a metallic object evidently came down and hovered right outside the King Ranch house, uh, which was located about a quarter mile away from where Snippy was found. But the woman who saw it was the grandmother, uh, Agnes King, and she didn't have her glasses on. She was at the sink doing dishes. And she noticed this, this like silvery shape that came down and actually it lopped off the tops of the corral posts. Uh, but because she didn't have her glasses on and she, she pretty much as blind as a bat, she couldn't tell what it was. If it wasn't for his own experiences, Harry may have brushed off his mother's report of a silver object in the sky. But like Agnes, he'd had his own share of peculiar sightings. Harry King, Nellie's brother, older brother, and uh, her other brother, Ben King, saw these things a number of times. And twice they mounted expeditions of, of uh, searchers to go up Middle Creek Hill, about three or 4,000 feet up, and search around this rock face where they saw these things go in to the mountain. They went up there and scoured the whole hillside and they could not find any indication of a doorway or some sort of egress point for these things to come and go. These kinds of sightings aren't exactly rare especially in wide open spaces like the San Luis Valley. The nearby city of Colorado Springs is home to the North American Aerospace Defense Command, as well as Fort Carson. And less than a decade later, Gabe Valdez would come to believe that helicopters from this area were being flown into the Dulce area of New Mexico, a place that would become synonymous with underground alien bases, and a place that we'll become incredibly familiar with as this series progresses. And Dulce is just over the west border of the San Luis Valley. It's very close. Yeah. As the crow flies, it's about 40 miles away. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a, a region that um, has reoccurring reports uh, that are reminiscent from one, one side of the, the mountains to the other. So with all this in mind, it's not surprising that when Harry finally found Lady's body in the muddy meadow on the morning of September 10th, 1967, all hell broke loose. Laying on her side on the soft ground, it looked as if she'd been a victim of a disturbing and ritualistic murder. There was a sharp cut at the horse's neck. It was precise, almost as if someone or something had created a careful outline to follow. Above the cut, not even a remnant of flesh remained. Everything was gone. And in the words of Nellie Lewis, There was no muscle, no meat, no ears, no mane, and not one hair of the mane stuck in the mud. The, the actual case itself is unlike any other case that's ever been reported. All the skin and 
hide and tissue, ligaments, connective tissue was taken from the tip of the nose all the way to the shoulders. The bones were blinding white, almost as if they'd been lying in the desert sun for years, or, as some reported, as if they'd been bleached. Which, it would take 30 years of bleaching in the sun in the desert uh, to duplicate that. So that, that fact alone, I think, is is really important because it it tends to dissuade somebody from simply dismissing the case. Alongside the distressing sight of her seemingly mutilated body, Harry reported a strong chemical smell surrounding the corpse, something akin to acetone, and Nellie reported a smell too. A strong medicine odor, and I have a feeling it might be embalming fluid. I've been going to try to find time to smell some. Why there would be embalming fluid, I don't know but it was a very strong odour. Later on, her husband, Burl, would say that the smell was definitely not embalming fluid and was more akin to medicine of some kind. They began to investigate the surrounding area, looking for any clues as to how Lady met her demise, and what they found was truly baffling. The horse's own tracks, Lady's tracks, were found 100 feet away from where the body was, was found. What could have picked up a horse, mutilated it, only to dump it a hundred feet away. Some hypothesized that rain could have washed away some of her tracks, but Nellie had an answer for that. There were no tracks except my brother's and he'd sunk down two to two and a half inches in the mud. He'd been stuck in his truck about a block from the horse and he said it took him two hours to get out and his tracks still remained, even though it was suggested that there could have been tracks and they were rained out. Now, I checked with the Weather Bureau. There was no rain between September 7th and September 9th. Nellie also said that because the ground was so muddy, they would have seen signs of Lady struggling, and she claimed that when Lady hit the ground, she made no further movements. And there were also these large 18-inch tracks that were found near the body that were punched very deep into the into the ground. APRO later tested samples of the ground and found no radiation, but Dwayne E. Martin, a forestry aide for the US Forestry Service, was called to the scene in the weeks after the discovery of Lady's body. He scanned the area with a Geiger counter, a device used to measure radiation, and he reported high levels of radioactivity around the carcass and Nellie Lewis's boots. The guy that actually did the Geiger counter testing had never done it before, and um, I don't think he realized when you're 7,500 feet up uh, from sea level that you're going to be generating a lot more um, background radiation from, uh, you know, from basically the sun. And, um, and I think the amount of radiation that he reported, it fell within background radiation levels. I, I, I don't think that there were there was evidence of uh, abnormal amounts of radiation at the site. Nellie found a piece of what appeared to be Lady's mane, and it was attached to something described as looking like chicken liver. She claimed to have broken it open with two sticks, and when she did, a green paste oozed out of it. It sounds delightful. Nellie also said that simply touching the mane that was attached to it caused her skin to burn and turn bright red with streaks across it, an injury that lasted for at least 30 minutes. Her husband, Burl described it as something akin to an acid burn. The night they found Lady's body, Nellie claimed that she was dizzy and sick and ended up at the doctor's office. Nellie turned to the local Alamosa County Sheriff, Ben Phillips, who, despite all of the strange factors in the case, dismissed Lady's death as a result of a lightning strike. Excellent investigative work from the police, as per usual. Others were more inquisitive, like Nellie's nephew, Don, who pointed his finger in a familiar direction. It could be the government experimenting with new weapons because they did fly around the valley at low altitude trying to evade radar. It was just practice flying, but you could imagine the pilot with a new weapon saying, let's try this out, see what happens. Lady being zapped by some high-tech top secret weapon is a compelling theory for sure, one that's much more believable than a lightning strike. But it didn't seem to explain a number of strange things that were found when Lady's body was finally analyzed by a doctor Doctor, two weeks after the discovery, things were about to get a whole lot weirder. Have you seen the
Like many other Coloradans, Dr. John Henry Altshuler had been fascinated by the reports of UFO sightings in the San Luis Valley. So much so that he took his wife and three children on a long weekend trip to Alamosa to covertly investigate. He didn't share his interest in UFOs with his family or colleagues, maybe fearing ridicule. And that feels incredibly sad to me. You really do have to find yourself someone that understands your need to trespass inside Great Sand Dunes National Park for a spot of nighttime sky watching. Otherwise, what's the point? The poor guy had to go it alone, but it wasn't a fruitless venture. He claimed to have seen three bright white lights moving together slowly at first, then shooting upwards and disappearing. In the account he gave to Linda Moulton Howe, he said that he was still watching the skies when the sun came up, and that was when he was found by the park police. They wanted to know who I was and why I was there. I begged them not to give out my name. I was afraid I would lose my job. My career would be finished if my medical colleagues learned that I was out investigating UFOs. You could say that Dr. Altshuler was a little paranoid, but perhaps he had reason to be, because he was about to be dragged into quite possibly the most infamous cattle mutilation case of all time, one that just so happened to be a bloody horse and not cattle. In a strange twist of fate, when he told the park police that he was a medical hematologist, they began to tell him about Lady his death on the King Ranch. And it wasn't long until they bundled him up into the back of the car and drove him over there. Imagine, you're just out trying to look for some strange things in the sky and suddenly you're face to face with the rotting carcass of a mutilated horse. That is one hell of a weekend away. Like everyone else that had been to see Lady's body, Dr. Altshuler was taken aback by the surgical-like nature of the neck wound. He later remarked that the outer edges of skin were firm, almost as if they'd been cauterized by a modern day laser. He looked at that horse and found that the internal sternum cavity of that horse in 67, all the major organs had been removed. And he said the thing that got him, since he had worked medically on cadavers of human bodies and other animals, including cows in his work as, as a medical student, he said there was no blood, there was no presence of fluid, there was no indication there were just dried blood anywhere in the cavity or, or around that horse. He said how you would remove these kinds of organs and have it be so clean was remarkable to him in 1967. He took some pieces of the mutilator's cuts and took them back to Denver. And under a microscope, he said he could see clear evidence of high heat at the edge of the wounds. This is 1967. Dr. John Altshuler has just arrived in the United States. He's brought some tissue samples with him which have been taken from these unfortunate animals. If we take tissue from an animal that has been killed and mutilated with some mechanism we don't really know. It's very different. It's very firm and very hard. Actually, looking at it grossly, you can't be sure. But when you look at it microscopically, there are a number of changes that are classic for heat, for high temperature, for burning. What, like a laser? Uh, like a laser, but in laser you get charcoal formation and you don't in the tissue here. In later life, he'd go on to work with Linda Moulton Howe on formulating a theory that linked RH negative blood with alien human hybrids, so maybe taken with a pinch of salt. Lady's body became a somewhat macabre tourist attraction in the local area. Sure, it might sound a bit odd, but let me tell you, if this happened anywhere near me, I'd be there in an instant. But despite the attention from locals, there were still no explanations as to what killed Lady and left her body in such a state. By all accounts, Nellie was certain that Lady's death had something to do with the strange sightings that had been occurring across the San Luis Valley. People suddenly start seeing odd things in the sky and then, just a few weeks later, her horse shows up with unexplainable injuries. It all seemed to fit together. As Christopher O'Brien points out in his book, Stalking the Herd, Nellie's nephew, Don, claimed that she'd linked Lady's death with something alien almost immediately. She'd seen strange lights in the valley, so right away she wanted to say it was extraterrestrial or something from outer space that did this, maybe with a laser beam or some kind of technology we don't know about, because it seemed to distinguish between flesh and bone. Now, like the cattle mutilations, there is no cause of death. We don't know why these animals die, and that should be uh, stressed. Uh, there is no apparent cause of death in these cases. And that holds true for the Snippy case. Despite being adamant that something strange had happened to her horse and desperate to get to the bottom of it, Nellie didn't want the story to go public. No, they didn't want the story to get out. Uh, Nellie and Burl 
uh, her uh, Nellie Lewis and Burl Lewis, her husband, and and Harry King and Agnes King. They they knew that if the story got got out, number one, that they'd be looked at kind of funny, <laughs> and when they went to town, and they knew that they would have looky loos coming out and tramping all around their pasture and frightening their livestock and and so they tried to hide it it was nelly's friend pearl uh nicholas who um was the society editor of the local paper she was the one that put the story in the pueblo chieftain that then was picked up by by the news services and it went around the world and became a huge news story. According to a March 1968 edition of Life magazine, Pearl had ordained herself as a flying saucer editor for the Valley Courier, and she soon became the go-to for UFO stories. A year later, she became a UFO investigator for NICAP. Whatever the actual chain of events were, from the moment the headline, Flying Saucer Sought in Death of Horse, appeared, Lady would become synonymous with animal mutilations of the extraterrestrial variety. Lady's mutilation inspired many others to come forward with bizarre tales of UFOs and mysterious visitors, some of them contacting the King family themselves. They allegedly received a call from a man named Milton Graves from Houston, Texas, who claimed that he'd seen two UFOs over the city that were heading north towards Colorado. Just three hours later, it was reported that Judge Charles Barnett, his wife, and his mother saw three ring-shaped objects accompanied by a strange humming noise in the Denver area. The press also reported a bizarre encounter from Eleanor Blundell, a painter who owned a curiosity shop and restaurant in Pagosa Springs with her husband. She claimed to have seen a crescent-shaped object similar to those spotted by Kenneth Arnold, and she even painted what she saw, hanging it for sale in her shop. According to her, a man arrived one day and insisted that she sell the UFO painting to him, and when she agreed, he said that he had no earth money, but that he'd be back at some point to seal the deal. He also supposedly said, I am not of your universe, and began to rant about humans wasting their energy on raising food when we can actually survive on the atmosphere itself. It's a bizarre story, but it's important to remember that the San Luis Valley has been home to all manner of interesting religious and spiritual groups. And to me, it sounds like Eleanor Blundell had a run-in with a breatharian instead of a man from outer space. From the get-go, the story of Lady's bizarre death was rife with misinformation and sensationalism. There's no better example than the fact that her name got lost in the annals of history and she became forever known as Snippy the Horse. Snippy actually belonged to Burl, Nellie's husband, and it's unclear exactly how the name mix-up happened. In interviews, Nellie even uses the name Snippy herself. Once the story was picked up by the national press, wild headlines like Did Outer Spacemen Kill Snippy the Horse began to appear, and the facts of the case quickly became blurred with fiction. Snippy was suddenly a star, and the newspaper editors couldn't get enough of the story, quoting Belle Lewis as saying, We see something. I won't say what it is every single night. When interviewed a year after the Snippy story first broke, Doc Kirby, the editor of the Valley Courier, said, We've printed about 10 stories on UFOs since October 1967. Snippy was the first of this phase. These tales grabbed public attention and made people want to pick up the paper. It's a very simple formula. More salacious headlines about alien encounters equals more money. He also told reporter Mel Four that students at the nearby Adams State College had painted a nearby blank billboard with the words Home of Snippy and the flying saucer capital of the world, warning people to look out for low-flying UFOs. It seemed like alien mania had hit the San Luis Valley, and as we'll come to find out, alien mania can provide a convenient cover for more nefarious and earthly goings-on. In late 1966, at the nearby University of Colorado, Edward Condon became the director of an Air Force-funded investigation into UFOs that many feel was rigged from the very beginning, probably because Condon's chief assistant, a man named Robert Lowe, drafted a memo that essentially said the investigation could reach a predetermined conclusion and effectively dismiss the phenomena out of hand, while on the outside appearing as if they'd investigated and remained neutral the entire time. It wasn't the 
first Air Force funded investigation either. There was Project Sign in 1948, followed by Project Grudge in 1949, eventually leading to the creation of Project Blue Book in 1952. It was the Condon Committee's findings that led to the eventual closing of Blue Book. You surely won't be surprised if I tell you they concluded UFO sightings to be mass hysteria, hoaxes or misidentifications. Given what we already know, and we'll come to discover about Air Force involvement in propagating the UFO myth to cover their own secret projects, it's not exactly surprising that an investigation funded by them would conclude that nothing has come from the study of UFOs and that further extensive study probably cannot be justified. I guess that's just what happens when you allow the military industrial complex to investigate itself. It was basically done as a way uh, to come up with a scenario within which the United States Air Force could say, well, nothing to see here. We're going to close down Project Blue Book. We're not going to be involved in this uh, anymore. And so that was a way to close down the, the PR uh, program that we, we you know, know as Blue Book. Project Blue Book. Before the Condon Committee concluded in 1969, they conducted various investigations into UFO phenomena, and just a few days after Snippy the Horse hit the headlines, they soon arrived on the scene to investigate. Three specialists were sent to the San Luis Valley. Dr. Fred Ayer, nuclear physicist and head of the committee's field investigation unit. Dr. Robert Adams, a veterinarian, and James Wadsworth, a psychologist. According to their own report, they spent several days in the area investigating, eventually concluding that an infection in the right side of Lady's body had killed her in a matter of hours. Now, of course, an infection could explain a fairly quick death, but it doesn't quite explain the condition of the body, most notably the fact that it looked like everything from the neck up had been stripped bare from the bones. Well, they had an answer for that too. We're supposed to believe that some stranger happened upon a horse that was riddled with a sudden infection, just so happened to have a knife on them, cut her neck to put her out of her misery with insane surgical precision, and then just disappeared into the desert never to be seen again. It makes perfect sense, right? Case closed. They also claimed that the area around Lady's body had deteriorated due to rain and sightseers, and that by the time they arrived, little could be accurately deduced. Despite that admission, they then went on to claim that the strange exhaust-looking marks that surrounded Lady's body were probably a fungus growth known as black alkali. When it came to Lady's organs being missing, Dr. Adams claimed that this was normal after the length of time this animal had been dead, a clear contradiction with Dr. Altshuler, who had been the first to examine Lady's body. Given the allegations of covering up for the Air Force that were eventually levelled against the committee, their dismissal of the Snippy case does raise suspicions. Suppose for a moment that Snippy's mutilation had been part of something the Air Force was involved in. Surely an investigation funded by them would be a clear conflict of interest. While there's no evidence that the Air Force, or any other agency for that matter, was involved, it's important to note what was going on at the time. On January 12th, 1967, around nine months before Lady would be found, chronic wasting disease was first discovered at the Foothills Wildlife Research Facility in Fort Collins, Colorado. It belongs to the same family as mad cow disease, caused by misfolded proteins called prions. It's been dubbed zombie deer disease, which paints a truly lovely picture. Colm Kelleher of Skinwalker Ranch fame writes in his book Brain Trust. There's a very interesting overlap in the spread of chronic wasting diseases in Colorado and Wyoming, and the increased number of reports of cattle dying mysteriously with surgical cuts and the removal of organs that subsequent research has shown are loaded with prions. Could it be that the strange object Agnes saw on the ranch was actually some kind of secret military technology involved in monitoring animals after the discovery of a brand new disease? It feels a lot more plausible than flying saucers, and it does explain ladies' missing organs. A lot of people wanted to cling on to the idea of UFOs being responsible for the mysterious death, and others wanted to go even more out there. According to John Keel, This particular case was badly muddled by an amateurish investigation and became the center of a totally meaningless controversy. NICAP's final conclusion was that the hoaxers had hauled a vat of acid out to the field where Snippy was prancing, slit the animal's throat with a scalpel, built a huge tripod with long heavy poles and lowered the horse into a vat of acid with block and tackle. Then they picked up their poles and vat and left. I know that there's been a lot of very 
strange hypothesis put forward about what happened to Lady. I think the most oddest of all was the, who was it that said that someone had come along, they'd set up a whole great big thing, strung her up and then dunked her head into it. Dunked her head in acid. Yeah. Who, who was it that said that? Um, I think it was either somebody from the, the Adam State uh, College uh, or who else? I bet it was it could have been Could have been somebody from, from well, I don't think it was somebody from NICAP. Formed in 1956, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, or NICAP as they're more commonly known, was full up to the brim with all manner of spooky characters from the get-go. In 1968, the Massachusetts Subcommittee Newsletter ran a small piece on Snippy. NICAP has informed the chairman through the affiliate slash subcommittee newsletter that several curious aspects have evolved from university studies of the Snippy the Horse case. These aspects include the horse's bones have turned to dust, portions of the horse's flesh were cooked, that the animal's tail glows in the dark, and that a black goo-like substance from underneath the carcass, which turned to white powder, contains unspecified living organisms. Honestly, at this point, who bloody knows what to believe? Lady was also examined by six scientists from the Desert Research Institute at the University of Nevada, and they weren't able to reach a solid conclusion either, hypothesizing that she may have been struck in the neck by lightning, but also claiming that no evidence of excessive burning was found around the neck. They even tested the strange chicken liver looking thing that was attached to the mane that Nelly picked up. They said it looked like a piece of dry seaweed and the analysis showed it was of plant origin. As for radiation, they didn't find any high levels, but that doesn't mean that radiation couldn't have played a role. Just three months after Lady's body was found, the Atomic Energy Commission detonated a nuclear bomb underground at the Carson National Forest in New Mexico, less than 100 miles away from the King Ranch, and strangely, only around 20 miles from Dulce. It was called Operation Gas Buggy, and I'm not suggesting that the two were connected. Obviously, the timeline doesn't really fit, but it will be something that we explore in more detail in further episodes. There's another interesting radiation theory, put forward by methylation researcher David Perkins in the late 70s. I put out a paper back in those days called Proximity Relationships, mm -hmm. and it got some news play, and the headline was Spokesman Says Mutilations or Test Animals for Radiation or something like that. That was me. So I, I spent a long time, and I had this map, which I actually took to the Schmidt Conference, which was this big board with a map of the US and Canada and I had pins in it for all the mutilations. Not every one because they were, I had to have representative pins, but it was just covered with pins basically. And with different, and then different um, nuclear facilities and all the nuclear power plants and uh, dumps and uranium mining and every single thing in the nuclear chain and to see if there was any correlation. And it sure looked to me like there was a correlation. I looked at it and I, just, I went over and over and over it. And it just seemed to me that somebody was interested in the nuclear uh, cycle. Again, something we'll explore in more detail in later episodes, but important to keep in the back of your mind for now. In January 1968, an Alamosa veterinarian named Dr. Wallace Leary claimed to have found two gunshot wounds in Lady's remains. One was in the left hip and one was in the right thigh. He claimed that nobody had found the bullet holes because nobody had bothered to turn Lady's body over while they were examining it, which does call into question just how thorough the prior investigations were. Leary had actually approached Nellie Lewis and asked for Lady's bones. I thought we might as well keep him around here because he's given us more publicity than we could ever pay for. I decided to mount the skeleton. It's a little unconventional, but Lady really did make history, so I kind of understand it. She was a macabre tourist attraction when she was first found, so it's not exactly surprising that somebody would want to keep her bones. Leary, the veterinarian with the bones, came up with an interesting theory. And I'm saying it's just a theory is that a couple of kids hit him with a couple of 22 slugs. Then the horse is scared and he takes off at a high lope and runs through a barbed wire fence. I've seen it before. 
That wire can clean an animal like a knife slicing cheese. That is a really lovely image, but I'm not entirely sure if I buy it. Well, uh, two students from Adams State College came forward and said that they snuck out there um, after the just a couple of weeks after the story hit the news that they snuck out there and, and shot the carcass a couple times. That really is delightful behaviour. I mean, who does that? That poor horse has been through enough. She's been dragged through hell. Now she's got a bunch of bloody college students shooting at her. Unbelievable. I'm not sure if we'll ever be able to reach a consensus on the case that everyone will be happy with. Debunkers will point towards the Condon report or Leary's hypothesis of barbed wire and gunshots, while ufologists will swear blindly that Snippy really did tangle with a flying saucer. If you want my opinion, I think some form of environmental testing is the most likely answer, but I can't prove it. And until then, it's just a theory. You know, Snippy to me is, is it's just a conundrum. I would say that we, you know, there's a good possibility that we're dealing with some form of cultural stigmata, that the planet itself may have somehow had something to do with the death as a warning. Maybe it's our collective unconscious uh, as humans that's doing it. Maybe it's something that Gaia, the planet is, is uh, doing. But I think there's some bigger causal element at play than simple aliens coming and gathering parts for lip and eye stew <laughs> or the military doing it. If you're at all familiar with UFO lore, then you've probably heard about the Men in Black. They can be traced back to the Maury Island incident, where Harold Dahl claimed to have seen six donut-shaped aircraft that rained down a strange type of metal that he claimed ended up killing his dog. Rest in peace. He claimed to have reported the incident to his superior officer, a man named Fred Chrisman, and if there was ever anyone who epitomised the word sus, it would be him. He shows up in all manner of strange places, including the JFK assassination. Harold claimed to have been visited by a man in a black suit. It was like, do you know what, Harold? You better keep your bloody mouth shut. A few years later, Gray Barker released his book titled They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, which solidified this idea of strange suited figures knocking about that were telling everyone to keep their mouths shut. But what does all this have to do with Lady? or Snippy's mutilation. I also was um was interested in um the one one part in the chapter on Snippy about Nellie's diary or potentially mm, right. what you potentially thought was Nellie's diary with the sketches and right. uh, sketches of visitations from humans and then it goes missing. Yeah, that was very very strange. Uh, the King Cabin which was on the upper part of the ranch uh had, had quite a history uh, just of, it, of its own, on its own. There was uh, quite a number of very interesting things that happened up there that still to this day remain very perplexing and unexplained. But uh, to have two guys, you know, on the work party dressed in basically in, in suits, but they, you know, took their suit jackets and, and shirts off and ties and uh, were helping clean up. And, and everybody thought they were somebody else's friend. As it turns out, when they disappeared and the, the you know, the sheaves of the paper with all the descriptions of craft and, and drawings and the rest of it that you described, when that ended up missing and these guys were missing, they, they had disappeared. You know, it, obviously people thought, well, those guys must have taken it. Who were those guys? And nobody knew who they were. Now, I know what you're going to ask me. Why would someone go to all all that effort to steal Nellie Lewis's diary. What was in it that could have been so interesting? It was like a, a spiral notebook, right? And some of the pages were torn out and, and put back in, just loose leaf. And uh, her name was written on the front of it, which is how they got the idea that it was hers. There looked to be uh, a, a sketch of a what looked like a patch that had a snake and a triangle. Uh, there was uh, some sketches of craft. There were sketches of these Nordic type uh, beings. Um, there were descriptions of sighting events, uh, descriptions of visitations. It might be a stretch of the imagination, but I think it's an interesting area to explore especially given what Nellie Lewis herself reported in late 1968. About two weeks ago, I got a threatening phone call. It was a woman's voice, and Burl said it sounded like a recording. The voice kept telling me to forget about these things I've seen or something terrible would happen. We couldn't reason with it. 
In other words, it wouldn't answer my questions. It just kept repeating what it had said. Of course, it could have been a prankster. It could have been anyone. But the same pattern crops up time and time again. Someone comes out with a strange story and suddenly they're being told to shut up. I know that some of you might be thinking, hold on a minute, Emily. I thought you were supposed to be a skeptic. And I can assure you that I am skeptical. When it comes to these kind of stories, my first instinct is to think that they're almost designed to stoke the fire. The people they're telling to shut up are highly likely to go out and tell everyone that they've been told to shut up. And if they've been told to shut up, then that must mean there's something to the story. The way that Nellie, you know, her demise, she said that her and her mother would transition beyond this realm to the next on the same day. And, you know, they buried her grandma or the grandmother, Agnes, uh, Nellie's mother, and she went back up there when everybody had left the cemetery and she uh, she killed herself with carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, there's there's a lot of very interesting elements uh, to that uh, story. And of course, it was a little touchy to try to dig too much with Burl when I interviewed him. But um, he said it did not make sense whatsoever. She had been doing fine. She had uh, had some help from Dr. Leo Sprinkle getting to the bottom of the trauma that she felt uh, from the you know death of her horse and from all the strange uh, goings-ons that had happened around her. Dr. Leo Sprinkle had interestingly been a psychological consultant at the University of Colorado as part of the Condon Committee. Uh, I serve as a consultant in psychology and my primary interest is working with those people who uh, claim to not only see uh, flying saucers but also claim to have had some kind of abduction experience or some kind of contact, uh, face-to-face contact with uh, alien beings who are associated with the uh, with the UFOs. He had links with APRO and other UFO organisations, often hypnotically regressing abductees and people that claim to have seen UFOs. On more than one occasion, Sprinkle was caught trying to plant the seeds of aliens into his regression subjects. And unfortunately, that's not uncommon in the world of UFOlogy. In his book, The Greys Have Been Framed, writer and researcher Jack Brewer compares the use of hypnosis by intelligence agencies to interrogate and induce memories in subjects to the way hypnosis is used by the UFO community. Whether it was intentional or not, factions of the UFO and intelligence communities would have found themselves in positions in which it was mutually beneficial to observe and study the work of one another in the areas of conducting hypnosis and embedding memes into popular culture. Their objectives were similar, their methods were similar, their behavior virtually mirrored one another, and their community members were, at times, one and the same. Leo Sprinkle will show up again in further episodes linked with other cattle mutilation hypnotic regression cases, one of which arguably started the idea of an underground base at Dulce. We can only speculate as to what occurred in Nellie's hypnotic regression, and the family weren't strangers to strangeness. Nellie's diary has never been recovered, and I don't want to discount what she may or may not have experienced, but I think it's important to at least highlight the fact that she was surrounded by people that had an invested interest in encouraging encouraging her beliefs. As for Lady, her bones ended up being mounted on a stand by Wallace Leary, and she was passed from one owner to the next. She ended up in the hands of a man named John Heflin, who tried to sell the bones on eBay for $50,000 but failed. I guess the market for infamous horse bones wasn't exactly booming. After he died, his widow eventually sold Lady, or Snippy's bones, to Judy Messaline, the owner of the UFO watchtower that sits off Highway 17 in the San Luis Valley. To me, it feels like the perfect final resting place for Lady, the horse that single-handedly kick-started the modern cattle mutilation phenomenon. In his book Stalking the Herd, Christopher O'Brien describes the Snippy case as ground zero and the beginning of a cultural meme that forever linked UFOs and mutilations. Even now, almost 60 years after Lady's body was found, is a case that not only remains contentious, but one that sticks in people's memories. If you're at all familiar with the 
world of ufology, there's no doubt that you would have heard about the infamous Snippy the horse. I wanted to start here because so much of the disinformation that was later used to target ufologists like Paul Benowitz has its roots in the strange world of cattle mutilations. It was the wave of bizarre and unexplained animal deaths in the later part of the 1970s in New Mexico, which led Paul Benowitz to a Colorado Bureau of Investigation conference in Albuquerque, where he'd eventually meet Gabe Valdez. I had uh, been working with uh, a highway patrolman up north uh, in the northwestern part of New Mexico around the mutilation area. And I was pretty certain, though that's not my main interest, obviously, but I was pretty certain it was connected. From there, the story only gets stranger. But that's all for next time, as we slowly descend down the rabbit hole of 1980s ufology disinformation together. And I'll leave you with some words of wisdom to keep in mind. Again, this couldn't be possible without viewer support on Patreon, so thank you to all of my patrons. And if you want to support the channel, you can sign up from as little as £1 a month. See you next time.